a pastor here, but maybe after this message, I will no longer be a pastor <laughs> because uh, uh, part of the, part of the uh, things that I, uh, uh, any pastor, undertakes is a vow to uh, uphold the uh, doctrines of the denomination they are a part of. And today's message is going to be a lot of things that you will not find in the Book of Discipline by the Free Methodist Church. So uh, if Bishop Matt hears this sermon, he may decide, what is this heretic doing in our fold? Okay. Or uh, even my son-in-law may decide, I am never going to let my father-in-law speak. <laughs> so, so that's part of uh, a disclaimer I wanted to bring is the Trinity is full of mystery and there are varied opinions about it and a lot of this that I'm going to share well, uh, especially this week is going to be a lot of things that I have thought through and I believe firmly but you will not find written in the book of discipline or any doctrine okay so I want to be very clear that it is not necessarily the stance of the Free Methodist Church, okay? And uh, it's not, uh, I care about being heretical. I don't believe it's heretical. I don't believe it goes against anything that the Free Methodists teach, but it's also not taught in a positive, okay? So it's kind of like when I was in pensions, there were different ways of interpreting the law. You would be surprised at that, I guess. One way was a very literal interpretation, so that if it didn't say it, you couldn't do it, okay? The other way it was, if it didn't say you couldn't do it, you could do it. So this is kind of more if you couldn't say you can do it, okay? Which is not really the stance of the Free Methodist Church, and that's why I'm making this, this disclaimer, okay? and. Part of this is we're going to look at this question. Does God engage in conflict? Okay? And sometimes we think uh, if we really knew somebody, th there would be no conflict. Right? We, we think an understanding of each other and everybody would get along. Right? And I, would, I am here to tell you that that is not necessarily the case. Because the, the Trinity are three perfect individuals, and yet there are times when they kind of engage in a disagreement or a wondering or what I would call conflict. And so sometimes the way we think of our relationships, the way we evaluate those relationships is, well, if there's no conflict, we must have a healthy relationship. And I would ask you to consider, maybe you don't have a healthy relationship if you have no conflict. And now I'm not saying that you look for conflict, right? I'm not saying you look for a fight. But what I am saying is that if you are who you are and the other person is being who they are, then I think there's going to be times when that's not going to rub real well together. And, and that there will be conflict, okay? And so what, what I wanted to look at first is one disclaimer, okay? And this disclaimer, disclaimer comes from the book of Job. And he says this, Job answered God, I'm convinced you can do anything and everything, nothing and no one can upset your plans. You ask me, who is this muddying the water, ignorantly confusing the issue, second-guessing my purposes? I admit it, I was the one. I babbled on about things far beyond me, made small talk about wonders way over my head. You told me, listen, and let me do the talking. Let me ask the questions. You give the answers. I admit, I once lived by rumors of you. Now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'll never do that again. I promise. I'll never again live on crusts of hearsay, crumbs of rumor. One of the things about knowing God is he wants you to know him personally. Not hearsay, 
not what other people say about him, although that can be helpful. But he wants, to, wants you to know him personally. And sometimes, as a preacher, we engage in hearsay knowledge of God and not really personal knowledge of God. And that's a bad thing. Uh, well, we, nobody knows everything about God, as it said in that passage. But the encouragement should be for you to engage whatever you hear or whatever you come to understand and, and engage it with God in it. Because you don't want to live off crumbs and hearsay. Because I have. And it's not very satisfying. So my encouragement for you is to take whatever is shared this morning and even in any sermon or any teaching you receive and really wrestle with God over the truth of it and see if it, if, it, if it really is truth or how that applies to your relationship with him. God is never afraid of questions because truth will stand no matter who questions it. Truth is truth. Truth is eternal. Truth does not change with opinion. So if it's true, it's going to stand up to scrutiny. When we are, when we feel insecure about the truth, that's when we can get defensive. But if we truly uh, have a complete and total embracing of the truth, I believe that we can be secure even when people are, are saying we're foolish. You want an example of that? You look at the cross where, where Jesus was told, if you really are the Son of God, come down off the cross and we'll believe you. But he didn't, because he knew, no, I know who I am. And this is what God has called me to, and on this I stand. And so, that's the first disclaimer, is everything I say to you, I truly believe. But that's me. And I would invite you to wrestle with God on your own, on this, and say, okay, is this really the way that, that it is? Okay. The second disclaimer is this. In Proverbs, there's these two verses. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So what are you supposed to do with a fool? Are you supposed to answer him? Or are you supposed to answer him not? The Bible, I believe, is meant to be taken as a s teaching that you can represent in different contexts. It's kind of like a class, right? If, the, the, if you learn the material so that you can get an A on the test, but then outside of the, the class, if, if you were asked to apply any of the principles on that test, you wouldn't know how to do it, then I would say you don't really know the material. To really know something is to be able to know it so that you can apply it in different situations and be able to, to utilize it. This doesn't mean the Bible contradicts itself, but what it does mean is, is this. If you're looking for a step-by-step -step glide to, to being able to how to handle relationships, I believe the Bible has guidelines, but it's not going to necessarily be specific to your situation. There's something more that has to be done. And that's why I believe God calls us into community with each other, that we can receive input so that it's not just our own understanding and then we apply it, but that we receive it from one another. And so, so am I saying not to think that the Bible is literal? No, the Bible is literal. You can trust these two statements, even though they are contradictory. But what you have to understand is there is a context in which one will apply and another, and the context in which the other will apply. And part of the wisdom of being able to engage in scripture is knowing well, which one is it, right? And I think part of that wisdom is gained in community, in having other people give you input, and prayer, right, and the Holy Spirit. But, so those are the two disclaimers. So I'm gonna give you a lot of principles here, 
But I don't want you just to use those principles and think, okay, I'm going to apply this, this, and this. I would add, invite you to, to really pray about it, maybe engage other people about it. If it has to do with another person, I would invite you to engage that person in, in the discussion of it before you decide that this is the way it's going to be, okay? Because I made that mistake myself many times, and it's not very effective. So let me, let's look at conflict, okay? So the first thing I wanted to look at was, does God have conflict in himself? And this is a passage out of Genesis, and it says this. The Lord saw that the w wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Okay. Two, three perfect beings, right? All decide, yeah, man, he's, he and she are meant to be inhabiting this earth. But they reached a point where they were in a disagreement about whether or not this was really good. Did we make a mistake? Why didn't you say something, right? I don't think he said that, but, but that's the, the tenor of the thing, is that there was, there was real grief, there was real disagreement about what, what had been done here, okay? And so they had to work through it. They stuck through it. The resolution of the conflict was, in this case, uh, there was a uh, flood, right? But man was preserved through the line of Noah, okay? And that's a whole different aspect, and, and it's, uh, I'm sure my son-in-law would love to tell you the story, so I'll let him tell it, okay? But there is conflict that God experiences within himself that he understands when we have conflict. So it's not like when God sees us in conflict, he's saying, what's wrong with you? He understands what's going on. And he, his desire is to have that conflict bring something healthy and something good, okay? The next place we're going to look at conflict is God in conflict with man, okay? This is the story of, of uh, Jacob, and the he is Jacob, and he says this. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and he crossed the ford of the Jackbach. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So Jacob wrestled with God all night, right? Uh, one of the things about this passage is if you wrestle with God, you're going to pay a consequence. So the rest of his life, Jacob limped. That's why uh, certain, there's a certain Jewish laws that say that the Jews aren't supposed to eat anything related to the hip of an animal because, it, because Jacob's hip was dislocated. Okay? But anyway, this to me is also an ex example of there's a there's a passage in Ephesians that says, do not let your anger, do not let the sun go down on your anger, right? Because in so doing, you will give the enemy a foothold, right? Jacob held on to God until he knew that God was going to bless him. And so part of conflict is to be able to, to know that the relationship is still intact. You may not agree with one another, thing, but that the relationship is still in, is in intact. And that's what Jacob did. He held on. He said, do you, 
are you still going to be with me? And, and so part of God is willing to wrestle with us, to have conflict with us. And part of it is that when we wrestle with God, he's going to show more of, of who he is. Could God have destroyed Jacob? Yes. If he just touched his hip and threw it out of joint, that kind of shows God kind of let Jacob wrestle with him, right, on his level. But Jacob was doing it with all his might and all his strength. And, he, and the best he could do is get a tie with God. But with that, God allowed him to be able to be blessed. And that, what we're going to see is one of the outcomes that God has in conflict is a multiplication, right? Because this is what the outcome was. His name was no longer Jacob. It's going to be called Israel, right? And Israel became the name of the nation. And the, the nation was designed to bless all people. So there was a multitude of blessings. So it was no longer just the, the family of of Jacob that was going to bless, it's going to be the whole world. Okay, so there's one of the outcomes I believe in conflict is that God has something bigger in mind than just that single thing that we, we tend to think. So let's look at some outcomes here, okay? This is an outcome of a conflict uh, that started in the Garden of Gethsemane that we looked at last week, and Jesus said, if there is any way that this cup can pass from me, let it be so, but not my will, but, but thy will be done. Okay? And then on the cross, he makes this statement. Now, about the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Sixth hour is noon, so the ninth hour will be 3 p.m. So the brightest, normally the brightest time of day, and all of a sudden it's all dark, right? And about the ninth hour, he cried out, Jesus cried out, with a loud voice saying, Eli, li, Eli, lemathathini, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you look at this theologically, it will, uh, the, a lot has been written about God actually turned his back on Jesus, that he actually deserted him emotionally. And that's why Jesus said this, right? A separation between parts of the Godhead. So what was what was going on there? Why was that? So and part of it is the understanding that God uses conflict to birth something better, right? I was at the birth of my two children, and each child, it was not a nice, clean kind of thing. It was bloody, it was messy, okay? And part of it that I realized was that this child who had been part of my wife for ni these nine months was now gonna be separate from them, from her. But that separation represented a greater potential for that child to experience life than if, if the child had just stayed in the womb. So the end of that conflict of labor was a new life. Was it clean? Was it messy? Was it not painful? Uh, my, your, my wife can tell you how painful it was, but it, I can tell it was very painful. Uh, and it was not clean. And so, even though you may understand principles of conflict, conflict is never going to be clean, I, I believe. There's going to be mess. There's going to be things that, that are basically kind of repulsive. I told, I told you last week, my, I'm high on harmony. I don't like conflict. I will avoid it at, at sometimes at my own detriment, right? But the thing is that the... Avoiding it does not make it go away. It stays. And the longer I let it go away, uh, the longer I avoid it, the messier it is when I actually engage it and move through it. Okay, so let me, let me back up here and, and we're going to make a uh, 
another. I said God had conflict in himself. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul. And he says this in Romans. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now I do what I do not want. I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not want, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of the Lord in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. This is a man who I believe Paul, well, Paul did write this after he had come to know Jesus, right? And yet he says he's got this struggle, you know, and some, some commentators say, well, he's talking about before he knew Jesus. Uh, I don't agree with that interpretation because he's basically saying, I know Jesus, but, but how come I still sin? What, what is it? And so he's got this conflict within himself, right? And the result of that conflict, I believe, is that he realizes that in his own strength, in his own person, he cannot live out the life that is best for him. That he needs the Spirit of God to, to dwell in him. Because he can understand it in his mind, but in his flesh, he's weak. It doesn't happen. And so it is only in the spirit indwelling that flesh and, tr and transforming that flesh that he can live out what he knows to be right. Which is part of the conflict, right? To be able to really see, well, what is the dynamic here? How do, how do we create a relationship so that the outcome we want of the relationship truly is going to be the outcome and not something that is not what we want, okay? So, last week I introduced Paul and Barnabas, and I said that uh, they were in, in a disagreement, so let me review that for, with this passage in, out of Acts. It says this, And after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of God and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take him, take with them one who had withdrew, withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been cut commended by the brothers by, to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. So I, I, we went through a little bit last week that Barnabas and Paul were godly men, right? They, they both knew Jesus. Barnabas had been one who risked his reputation and things for Paul bringing him into the fold when, when other people were saying, we can't trust him. And they had gone through a missionary journey together, facing a hostility and things. And, and Barnabas and Paul had worked together well in ministry. And now Paul was saying, let's do this. Let's, let's go again. And Barnabas is saying, yeah, let's do it. And let's take John Mark. And Paul is saying, what? Don't you remember at, the, at the, the very beginning of our ministry together, 
what happened? Like there was hostility, and John Mark went home. He ran away. We can't we can't have that. But Barnabas said, No. I believe Barnabas said this. No, we, we have to we have to believe that John Mark has grown from this. That he's 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 now needs a second chance. And maybe Paul and maybe Barnabas brought up the fact that remember Paul, when you first tried to, to do the work of ministry, what happened? You got sent home. And I brought you back to Antioch. And then since then our our ministry has grown together. So maybe, maybe John Mark is the same way. And Paul said, no. No. John Mark's not going to make it. That's, this is not for him. And so they, they disagreed to such an extent that he said, okay, Paul, if you feel that way, you go by yourself. I'm taking John Mark, and we're going to do ministry together. And so they left. Now, some people think that this disagreement was personal. I don't believe it was personal. I believe it, it was over the issue of John Mark. And I believe that Paul and Barnabas continued to maintain contact with each other. And this, that's the second part of this outcome, part two. After this happens, and on the second missionary journey, there's in Acts 18, 1, it says this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Okay, so Paul establishes a church at Corinth and things. He uh, leaves, and then there's trouble in Corinth, and, and they're questioning whether or not he's an apostle. So he writes this letter, and in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, he has this statement. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? So basically, he's linking himself up with Barnabas. Now, if you thought Barnabas was such a... Uh, off in his thinking and things he would not link himself up with him but he links himself up with him and so I believe they they still had a a relationship they still talked to one another and I believe that Paul because of his relationship with Barnabas was able to see John Mark in a different way and let me look let's look a little bit at John Mark so it it says in, in Acts 12 12 he says when he realized, this is Peter, he's been released from, from uh, prison, and he says, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where there, many were gathered together and praying. John Mark was part of uh, the group that met in his home. Uh, and so he was exposed to the teachings of the apostles, and uh, he was basically, to maybe make it have a current context, he was basically raised up in the church, right? He was, he was a church boy, right? So he knew, he knew the doctrines, he knew things. In Colossians 4.10, it says this, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. So Barnabas and, and Mark, uh, they were uh, related, right? Which may have entered into some of Paul's thinking about why do you want to bring this guy who, who's been raised in the church, and the first time he faces conflict in the world, he runs, say, no, nah, leave him in the church, leave him, leave him at home. And Barnabas says, no, right? I said that Mark was the author of the Gospel of Mark, and one of the reasons uh, some commentators feel this verse is in there because he is. So this is out of the book of Mark, and it says this. And a young man followed him, and nothing but, with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So this was the night that Jesus was betrayed, and uh, the, the thinking is that, that Mark was there listening, and he, he saw Jesus get arrested, and he saw that the soldiers were, were 
going to take the people and, and the disciples were fleeing. So he was in his pajamas, basically. He, he didn't go dressed. And, and so what happened was they caught his pajamas and he went home naked. Okay. Now, I don't know if Paul knew this story, uh, but Mark was pretty open about it. So Paul may have known it. So in Paul's thinking, it may have been, you know, John Mark has a habit of when things get tough, he runs, right? And so I don't want that. I don't want that, right? And another passage is First Peter. It says this, She who is in Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Uh, I believe this is a, a reference not necessarily to Mark being uh, Peter's actual son, but most commentators feel like the s- Gospel of Mark was, if Peter had written a gospel, it would have been exactly the Gospel of Mark. So, so Mark was kind of uh, Peter's spokesperson in that. And th- this kind of confirms that kind of close relationship. Okay? But I believe there was a reconciliation between Mark and, Peter, uh, and Paul. And in Paul's last letter, he writes this. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Okay? Paul was not afraid to say this guy is not following God. He, t- he says that about Demas. If you want to do a study on a guy who slips a long way, you can do a study on Demas. Because Demas was one of Paul's associates. And the last thing he writes about Demas is he is in love with the present world, right? And he's, he's gone. He's deserted him. So if Mark didn't have a good relationship with God, in Paul's estimation, he would have said that. He was not afraid of that kind of thing. But instead he says... He's very useful for me for ministry. And and I believe that was the very issue that divided he and Barnabas, right? It was the issue of ministry. It was the issue of uh, taking John Mark along in ministry. And so now Paul sees, yeah, John Mark is very useful. Very useful. Which leads to some things to think about, okay? And... One is, all relationships have conflict. That if you're going to be in a relationship with someone, you're going to have conflict. And so, having conflict does not necessarily mean you have a bad relationship. In fact, I would say it's the exact opposite. If your relationship doesn't have any conflict, then I would really look at your relationship and see what's going on. Okay, And the result of separation can lead to multiplication. The result of, of God turning his back on Jesus on the cross was that Jesus became our sacrifice and allowed us now all to enter into the fellowship of, of God. That's a multiplication. That opened the, in, the door for that invitation. The result of Paul and Barnabas' separation was the gospel of Mark got written. Paul established many churches. The kingdom was moved forward. There was a multiplication. So I would invite you, when you're in the face of conflict, to know that, yeah, it's hard, but God has a great purpose in mind, which is like the birth of my children, right? Right? all that pain and and, uh, gore. When I look at my two daughters, I say, well, I think it was worth it. You can ask my wife if it was worth it, right? But, but, But it did bring a multiplication because I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what my daughters are doing with their life. And, and they are bringing, I believe, glory to God in their life. And so there was a multiplication. There was a conflict. There was, there was things that, that seemingly, what good can come of this, right? But there was a multiplication. 
So I like to consider these things as a what now, okay? Pastor Tim, I'm using his terms here so he can probably explain it better than I can, but he talks about relationships having three stages, uh, forming, storming, and performing, okay, very literate and things. Uh, I, I, I use these terms, establish, connect, interact, okay? Forming or establishing is in the first part of a relationship, you're learning to know who each other is. And it's, it's a matter of creating uh, an understanding or being able to see each other, right? So that's like establishing or forming. Uh, your interactions uh, are normally only the things that you and, and this other person can interact with but, and not have a, any kind of conflict or things. So it's a stage that I like to stay in a lot of times. It's, it's just this forming and establishing stage. Connect is, if I really want to connect with somebody, then that means I'm going to run into things that I don't d agree with. Or as Pastor Tim calls it, storming. That, that, that there, another person wrote it, it's a time of chaos, disorder. That the way that, that we thought things were Aren't, aren't the way that they are. So you, so you have this period of storming. You have this period of conflict. And through the storm, if you're, if you're willing to go through the storm and not go back to just to the forming or the establishing stage, is the last stage is performing. Uh, Pastor Tim calls it, I call it interacting. That you've made this connection now, and now you and this person can interact over that connection. Okay, and then what happens is that when you are interacting, you're going to establish or form, and then you're going to go through storm. So it's it's a civic, it's a it's not where you reach an interact stage and that's it. Relationships are organic; they keep growing, they keep changing, because you, you start your understanding of yourself changes and grows, and the. Understanding of that other person changes and grows. And so that's where this interaction has to happen and, and to be able. And I, so I believe there's three areas that God invites us to look at where are we as far as establishing, connecting, or interacting. And the first area is between he and, and you, God. Where's your relationship with God? Is it forming? Is it storming? Is it performing? Is it establishing? Is it connecting? Is it interacting? Okay. Second place is others. You and, and some other person, right? Where is that? And maybe sometimes the, the first place to start is you. Inside of you. How do you feel about yourself? What things go around in your head when, when you have what's called self-talk? Right? When you just sit down and, and let whatever thoughts come into your head, what kind of thoughts come into your head? Like, you know, are they thoughts of, well, you should have done that better. Oh, boy, you should blew that. I would say that that's an invitation to engage in conflict. Because I would say that's, to me, part of what Paul was talking about in Romans 7. That in your mind, you, you know what is good, but in your flesh, it's sin dwells. And the answer was, only in Jesus can we overcome those things. Not through trying harder, not through knowing more, only through Jesus and his Holy Spirit, which he talks about in Romans 8. Okay? So, I would invite you to take this and ponder it. Okay? Like I said, this can make a whole lot of sense to you in your head, and that's wonderful. But if it, if it only makes sense for you in your head, then I'm sorry. That's like living off of rumors and crumbs. But if you make it your own, if you wrestle with it, then I believe it's transformative, and it accomplishes what God wants truly with his truth. So why don't we bow a word of prayer?